welcome to our Good Friday service at St John's Presbyterian Church Annerley. Um, you're also invited, of course, to the services we have on Sunday. Uh, morning worship in the 9.30 is normal and evening worship at 6.15 and both of those services, the theme on the resurrection from John. Um, with those words of, uh, of uh, information, let's just take a moment to prepare for our worship this morning. worship today comes from the 98th Psalm and it's verses 1 to 3. So let's hear God's word as he calls us to worship him this morning. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. The Lord has made known his salvation, his righteousness he has revealed in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his mercy and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. And there are few words in the Old Testament that are more appropriate to Good Friday than those three verses from the 98th Psalm. Well, this Let's now adore God in our prayers on this Good Friday morning. Let's all pray. Almighty God, our great Father in heaven, in this hallowed hour which we have set aside for worship on this day, set aside for the remembering of the death of Jesus Christ our Lord, we do humble ourselves afresh in your presence as the just judge of all the earth and yet the merciful Saviour of the world. In the crucifixion we see both of these wonderful attributes of your perfect nature for this reason today we rejoice in both and we praise you for both in our service. Your justice is perfect in that you will by no means ever leave the guilty unpunished. We would be disturbed if not distraught at the thought that you would have no concern for evil and that you would not deal with it all to the very last thing and justly. When we expect that of our courts and our lawmakers to act justly, how much more than judge of all the earth. We also rejoice in the mercy that comes to us through the forgiveness of sins. That you have promised that all who confess their sins to you, you will faithfully and justly, justly forgive. We thank you for this too, which is guaranteed by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, his death and his resurrection. And so as we remember, as we remember the death of our Saviour, the very Son of the living God, we do so, O oh Father, for your praise, for your justice and your mercy, that kissed in the atoning death of Jesus Christ on the cross, 
all sins punished in him or the sinner because of your justice but all sins also forgivable and through him to those who will ask so we bring our worship to you this day in that name in the name of jesus christ our lord and savior amen we're going to sing from the 98th psalm now sing to god new songs of worship account of the crucifixion, Matthew chapter 27 and verses 32 to 55. Let's hear the word of God together this morning. Now as they came out, that is of the city, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and they compelled him to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is, to place, that is to say, the place of a skull, they gave Jesus sour wine mixed with gall to drink. But when he tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lost, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put up over his head the accusation written against him, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and the other, and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. And if you are the Son of God, Come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. 
If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now. If he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness all over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them came and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest of them said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and save him. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. And the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints that had fallen asleep were raised. Coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they appeared in the holy city to many. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly and they said, Truly this was the Son of God. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee ministered to him, were standing and looking from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Joseph and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Amen. Let's now take a moment to confess our sins this morning as we remember our Lord Jesus' cross. Let's all pray. Our gracious and most merciful God, as we remember the death of Jesus Christ our Lord today, we remember our own need to search our hearts, to seek out sin that needs to be confessed and forgiven. At this moment when we are reminded of how seriously you view and treat human sin, we must consider confessing our sins, for they are many and often more than we know or realise. We confess that all evil begins in the heart and the mind, and that there is more darkness and more dark emotions that go on there than we realised or would like to admit about ourselves. We confess there are times when we hate too easily and too quickly and often without justification. We confess to corruptions like jealousy and impatience and foolishness and pride and that these ultimately are the real reason for the hate, not necessarily the faults or frailties of others. Otherwise we would be patient and slow to anger and speaking with grace and concern. We confess we have tongues too, which at times we wish we could cut out for the regretful things that we say. We confess that we cannot tame our tongues as the Apostle warned, because in the end we cannot contain our passions. We use our words as weapons, and even when it is not malicious, we acknowledge that it is still reckless and thoughtless and hurtful. We are truly not what we think we are in such moments. We are only what others see, and what they see cannot, and what they see we cannot, blinded as we are by our false perceptions, unsee. So forgive us, our God, for the offence that we can cause to you and to others, and help us to see more of the truth about ourselves, especially our fault, as we look in the mirror of Scripture and in the righteous examples of others. <coughs> Forgive us for judging others by standards that we ourselves don't and sometimes can't keep. Grant us a humble spirit devoid of foolish pride, filled with honesty and mercy, patience and kindness, especially toward those who wrong us and in particular to those whom we know the best and love the most. Help us to grow up through all of this into the likeness of Jesus Christ, who loved us even while we were yet his enemies and gave himself for us. These things we ask with the forgiveness of all our many other sins in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing uh, the hymn, There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son. Mm -hmm. 
the scriptures again to the Word of God, to one of the more, most remarkable portions of scripture. Isaiah 52 it is. Isaiah 52. And the beginning of what is called the, uh, the third servant song of our Lord Jesus. The prophecy of Isaiah in Isaiah 52 beginning at verse 13 and carrying on through to the end of 53. Remarkable description of the life and work and purpose of our Lord Jesus Christ in his atoning death. So Isaiah 52 verse 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what they had not been told, them they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. But who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He had no form or attractiveness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, hid as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. But surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, Yet we considered him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But it was he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. And he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had no, done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul uh, when you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labour of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify the many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Amen. And to God be all the glory for that portion and the one from Matthew in his word. Let's take a moment now to respond to God in his declaration of the coming of Christ and its great purpose in our redemption by giving thanks for the offering and also taking a moment to pray for others as our Lord Jesus always does. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you this morning for the great altar that we call Calvary whereupon the Lamb of God was slain for the sins of the world and even our sins where the assurance of forgiveness was sealed in the blood of a new covenant, a covenant of peace between you and all those who will humble themselves and repent and accept the promise of forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the grace to respond to that offer of the mercies of divine love and for using that to inspire us to give generously to you in every way. So for the gifts that have come today, we thank you. We plead that you'll be pleased to use them to bless the lives of others in many practical ways, especially in these mission works in places like Vanuatu.
We thank you for the labours of our brothers and sisters in these places and all the missions that we support. We ask today that you would bless them with peace and joy in the knowledge and the reminder of Jesus' saving death on Calvary for them. Our Father, we remember also today, as we always do at this time uh, in our year and our culture, that many will be remembering this day and um, with thankful hearts for your mercies through Jesus Christ. But there will be those who will suffer during this time, uh, car accidents, illnesses of various kinds, injuries, uh, to which uh, our emergency service workers will have to go. And we pray, our God, at this time that your mercies may be great over this period, that you would be pleased to provide um, for those who are injured um, and suffer the care that is necessary. We thank you for the, the ministering heart that's in our um, emergency service workers, and we think particularly of, uh, of Dan Armstrong and uh, his son Corey in Tasmania, and Mary Brigden also. We do pray for um, the, those who profess faith uh, in the midst of our state emergency service workers that they would be diligent to do that in word and in deed, that their compassion might be, might be also matched with a willingness to speak of the mercies and the grace of God in such times. We think of the chaplains uh, and the pastors who will go in the midst of these uh, tragedies and sadnesses, that you would help them to bring a consoling and comforting word of God to bear on those who suffer uh, and those who grieve, especially having lost loved ones in these circumstances. We pray, our God, also for um, the camps that will be going on, the Easter camps, that the gospel of Jesus Christ may be preached faithfully, that the atonement and its effect and the call of, God, call of God upon the lives of people in the wake of it might be heard, and that many may respond, as indeed many have responded, in these ministry opportunities around our country. We pray also for your blessing upon the word of God as it comes to us this morning about the cross, a familiar passage, but it's important to be reminded again of how we have been saved and how we have the peace that we now have with you through Jesus Christ. We ask all of these things in the name of our Saviour. Amen. Let's sing now of uh, the, uh, the servant who was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as the prophet said he would be, and that's our hymn, 206, Man of Sorrows. <laughs> 
after September 11, 2001 and the terror attacks on the World Trade Center, one of the questions that people were asking and in shock was, where was God on that day? The other question that was being asked is, why did God allow this to happen? When unspeakably great evil occurs, people often look to God for answers. Questions like this are inevitable and understandable in the absence, particularly of the knowledge of God and his ways. And there were many in the world at that time who had neither the knowledge or the understanding of God's ways. Of course, there were many who could answer those questions in many legitimate ways for them. The presence of evil, the great evil, even great evil, does not shake their faith in the goodness or the wisdom of God in spite of the terror. In fact, as we know, it strengthens it because they understand why God sovereignly ordains evil, even though God does not perpetrate that evil. Good Friday is the remembrance of the greatest evil that was done in that the very Son of the Living God was, at least humanly speaking, ruthlessly set up, framed, and then murdered by a very corrupt political and religious leadership. We could say the Creator was murdered by a very corrupt creature, uh, and maliciously so. Creatures he came to save, and some he eventually did save, as Acts chapter 2 verse 37 reminds us. So it was a day of strange and of, and of some unexpectedly shocking events. But the question, the question arises was, what was God's role in all of this? The answer to the question um, concerning this, uh, the answer to this question is that God was not, of course, the perpetrator in this that God was in fact the sovereign Lord of these events and the events of Good Friday had been anticipated from 4,000 years earlier when God warned Eve that her great descendant, her seed, would suffer himself in destroying the enemy that had deceived and spiritually killed her. Then in the most detailed way the prophet Isaiah spells out how Eve's great descendant would suffer, how he would accomplish that task uh, and why he would accomplish that task in his prophecy from 52.13 to 53.12. So we're just going to look at a couple of things that happened that day that God was doing in answer to the question, where was God on that day and what was God doing? As Jesus was crucified the day after the Jewish pastor, Passover in what was the 202nd year of the Greek Olympiad or the year 33 AD can nail it down with two dates now, one from the pagans and uh, one in terms of the Latin. So the first of these things that God was doing was that he was ordaining all of the sufferings that took place uh, for Jesus. God was bringing, God, what God was doing was bringing the suffering of Jesus predicted by the prophets and by God himself to Eve to pass. Here is what the prophet Isaiah saw eight centuries before Jesus came. Quote, it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. Verse 10, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. So why would he do that and why so violently? The answer is in the next part of the verse relating to the concept of the guilt offering. But let's stay on this point for a moment that God willed and ordained this evil to happen. Doesn't that make God evil? Doesn't that make God Jesus' real murder, as some erroneously argue? Well, the answer is no. God did not kill his son. God didn't even incite those who murdered him. God did not drive, manipulate, or provoke the evil that was done to Jesus any more than he provoked, manipulated, or drove the terrorists who did what they did on 9-11. It is plain to see that these perpetrators acted in accordance with their own desires. Their hatred of Jesus was their own, not from God. Their plans were their own and were not put in their hearts by God. Even Judas, who, whose betrayal sparked the fearful events of the crucifixion, was not prompted or provoked by God. Specifically, it was someone else who did this, namely Satan, as Luke and John record in their Gospels. But it was not God. The sin... The evil is all from the creature, 
And that is what the Apostle Peter said in the first Christian sermon of the church. Verse 23, Jesus being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and you have crucified and put to death. Peter reminds his listeners that they had taken Jesus illegally, the lawless hands, they had crucified him and they had put Jesus to death, not God. Yes, God had determined that Jesus would die, but it would be through the natural hostility of Jesus' enemies at an appointed time. This was not the first time that God had used human evil to bring about a supreme good. In Genesis 50 verse 20, Joseph famously said to his brothers that all the troubles that they had caused for him, as well as all the troubles that others like Potiphar's wife and his fellow jailers did, God had willed in order ultimately to save the world from a great famine. God willed the troubling events, but the humans involved acted out of their own malice and evil. And there is a great mystery here. Further, they are responsible for that evil and they knew it. When Peter used the preacher's pronoun you in the sermon in Acts 2.23, these people were stricken with their guilt. They knew they were part of the mob that bade for Jesus' blood and they cried out in response, Men and brothers, what shall we do? That's in Acts 2.37. So what was God doing on Good Friday? Well, he was willing the crushing and the suffering of the Son of God at the hands of evil men. He was not up in heaven wringing his hands in helpless despair. He was fulfilling to the letter a long promise he made to Eve in Genesis 3.15 confirmed through the prophet Isaiah, as we've read this morning, that the Son of God himself should come and give his life as a part of God's plan to save the many, just as he willed Joseph's many sufferings in order to save the lives of many, probably millions. God appointed the means by which he would declare to the world his love for humanity in the death of his Son to atone for its sins against him. Jesus was being crushed according to that will of God. He was being bruised, as the Hebrew word can also be translated. That word speaks of oppression and humbling, but the notion of physical injury is the main part of the meaning of the word. He also suffered, and the Hebrew word also reflects physical experience, where it speaks of weakness. It's often associated with illness, but here with complete humiliation, and ultimately in death. In fact, the whole of the Old Testament sacrificial system points to this very moment. Every sacrifice of the Old Testament was pointing to this moment that God, uh, that God had willed through the evil of the then Jewish religious and political leaders and the cooperation of the Roman legal system and its office bearers. You could say the abuse of the Roman legal system. When John the baptizer introduced Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, in John 1.29, he was warning God's people of what God would do through Jesus of Nazareth on this very day. He was speaking of that day, which we remember this morning, when his only begotten son would go through persecution and death for a great purpose, with which there are several other great purposes, specifically, specifically our deliverance from sin's consequences and also from the deliver, our deliverance from its bitter effects through the work of the Spirit that came as a result of the work of the cross. So let's not forget the implications of this personally for us in terms of Romans 8.28, which I'm sure most of you will know. It says that God works all things together for good for those that love him. As that verse says, we need to look behind our troubles when they come to us. We need to look behind any malice or cruelty from others. We need to look behind any failure or tragedy and we need to see the wise purposes of God which have been ordained for us in that suffering. Calvary, of course, was the greatest travesty of justice, the biggest collapse of expectation and hope, the worst example of terrifying despair, and yet God willed it for this greatest of all purposes, this greatest of all victories, and greatest of all hopes, peace with God forever for those who looked to, to God through Christ. What God is doing in the midst of your troubles is not to harm you, as one of the great hymns says, but to help you. And there is no greater help for the living than the dying of Jesus Christ 
for those who trust in him. So this is the first thing that God was doing in terms of ordaining the suffering of Jesus on that, uh, that uh, terrifying and a shocking day in the life of the early church. He was also doing something else through Jesus' suffering, and that was that he was atoning for our sins. What God was also doing on Good Friday was not merely ordaining the death of Jesus, but the purpose of that death. The prophet Isaiah defined it in a very dramatic and somewhat shocking terms as follows. The Lord makes his life a guilt offering. The Lord makes his life a guilt offering. Through all that injustice, cruelty, brutality and traumatic death, Jesus was being made a guilt offering. He was not made a martyr. He was not made an example of stoic and heroic faithfulness to God. He was certainly not made a helpless victim. He was in fact the very opposite of all of that. And yet he was more than that. His life is here called a guilt offering. God made his life into a guilt offering. So what is that? What is a guilt offering? Remember that we are still in a time when the Old Testament law was in force, at least until the very moment of Jesus' death, when that temple was split in two. Temple curtain, sorry, was split in two. The guilt offering, sometimes translated a trespass offering, is a special offering, as one commentator explained. The trespass offering, an expiation, is an expiation for the sins of God's people, cleansing, purification. The distinctive element in the guilt offering being that the man who confesses his guilt, voluntary or involuntary, paid his money in shekels, according to the judgment of the priest, offered a ram, the blood of which was sprinkled upon the altar. It involved, that is, the idea not only of an atonement, but also a satisfaction according to the nature of the sin. If you were to damage something precious belonging to someone else, or injure them badly, you would expect to pay for that damage or injury. Otherwise, you might be sued and even go to jail. Well, our sins, our disobedience to God caused that kind of offence and consequence. God on Good Friday made that death of Jesus a means of paying for the damages done to God for our disobedience. So while the enemies of Christ were busy murdering him with a view to silencing him and his followers, God overrode all that behaviour and made Jesus' death in that circumstance an offering to pay for the offence the damage done to God by our sins. When you accept Jesus' death as payment in full for your sins, that offering becomes fully effective for us and for you personally. It is worth noting here the question that people often ask when they don't like the idea of a sacrificial death of Jesus for sin. Why didn't God just pardon and forgive as presidents and monarchs can do? Why does God require a compensation, not just a cleansing, a settlement price for our offences against him? God made Jesus' death a guilt offering to reveal his attributes of mercy and justice in one act. God chose to do this on this day and in this way to reveal something of himself to us as well as to meet the need of the situation created by our offences against him. When we break our society's laws, a payment is required or a pardon. And God made Jesus' death that day just that, a payment. He foreshadowed this in the sacrificial system with the animal death as we have heard. Israel would know, as we should know, the deadly seriousness of God regarding human sin. Further, we would not know how serious sins were, except that scripture says physical and spiritual death flow from both. He wants us to look at the cross and understand that sin which is lawlessness, as John said, is deeply offensive to him and extremely dangerous to us as to consequences. He also wants us to know that stark truth by making Jesus' death as this guilt offering. Every Lord's Supper we are reminded of this truth, that his body was given and his blood shed to this very end of clearing away the offence of sin in our lives and encouraging our holiness because of this expiation of our sin and the removal of guilt. This is what God was doing on Good Friday. He did it and accomplished his purposes for us, even though we may have trouble grasping all of it. I want you to be clear about this at this point. This is the critical message of the Christian faith. There are many other things in which people can be interested, about which men can preach and teach and promote, 
But if we are not preaching the message of the ancient prophet, that Christ died as a guilt offering for our sins, to cleanse and to pay for the offence, we are failing in our ministry. We are robbing our listeners of the one vital truth that will restore them to God. Here are some statements to drive this home this morning. As we remember the cross of Jesus of Nazareth, the promise of the old covenant, Paul drove home the imperative of the core message of the gospel, the good news, that leads to peace with God and the assurance of salvation, firstly, in 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. Paul said, For I delivered to you first of all, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. The core message, Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Which Scriptures? Well, the Old Testament. Paul didn't have the New Testament. He died for our sins according to the Old Testament Scriptures. And what do these say? We've just read it in Isaiah 52.3. Then there is 1 Corinthians 15, 3, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I received, that Christ died, for, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. A similar statement. What Scriptures is he talking about? Again, is it not Isaiah 53, 10? Well, what about Isaiah 53 and 11 and 12? By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify the many, for he shall bear his iniquities. Because he poured out his soul unto death, he bore the sin of many. This is why the Apostle Paul said, um, also wrote, For the Jews request a miraculous sign, and the Greeks seek, seek after wisdom. We preach Christ crucified. So whatever else you may hear about God, about life after death, about the Christian religion in general, without this truth that there is reconciliation to God through his death, it will profit you nothing. Only as you understand that someone has cleared your debt can you begin to be safe. Only as you embrace that truth that Christ died for you personally, only as you seek forgiveness and peace with God personally, that you can have any safety and security from the consequences of your sins against God and against others. Isaiah 52, 53 represents the most accurately detailed prophecy in all of the scriptures along with the prophecy of Jesus about the fall of Jerusalem in Matthew 24, 25. Isaiah is arguably the more remarkable because the fall of Jerusalem is not completely unlikely given the mood of the day and only 40 years waiting time. Isaiah saw this 700 years ahead of time, but then given the importance of this issue of eternal safety of men and women through Jesus Christ and the message of it, we ought not be surprised. It is that important. God preached the good news through Isaiah in Isaiah 53, 4-6 and 10-12 of how his suffering servant would save the rebel to God of any age who repents and asks for mercy through the atoning death of that beloved servant. So, where was God on September 11, 2001? That's a question worth asking after those aircraft plunged into the Twin Towers of New York and the others as well. Well, I want to assure you that in the midst of all of that, he was working in the hearts of many people to bring them to himself through Jesus Christ. Through those events, which he sovereignly ordained, he drove thousands of people into public, public worship to seek him. One New York church pastor alone, Pastor Timothy Keller, was able to count over 800 people who, when suddenly faced with their mortality, the sight of those events returned to God, our God, and they were saved from their sins and permanently, years after, he could write that and say that. How many hundreds, if not thousands of other people were so affected in the USA and around the world, without that event, they would never have been so eternally affected. How many times has God overruled great evil in order to bring about great good? Where was God on Good Friday? Well, he also was governing the events of this part of history to fulfill a mercy-filled promise that he had made long before through an 8th century prophet to send a saviour to deliver his people from the consequences of their sins. That's where God was. Like 9-11, he was not committing or provoking the evil, but overriding it for these blessed ends, as the Apostle Peter said in his first sermon after Jesus' death and resurrection. 
as God did with Joseph's mistreatment by many, that he ordained to, to ultimately to save the ancient world, perhaps in the millions, from starvation. For the church, this is a familiar truth, almost too familiar in some cases, but it becomes personally real and powerful when anyone becomes aware of their offences against God or God's purity and justice, or better still, when they become aware of both. It is the only antidote to the conflict that exists between men and women who are not reconciled to God and that God himself who longs for them to be reconciled. The famous hymn Rock of Ages says it so well and so truly, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. All that is required is for people everywhere to be reconciled to God, turning from their sins, trusting in that death alone to clear the debt for them to God. This is the promise and the hope of Easter, and the resurrection is the living proof of it, as we shall hear in two days' time, and all to God's glory. Let's all pray. Our Father, we have heard again uh, this message that is core to the life of each person who is reconciled to you and core to the ministry of the church. But it is not just a ministry, it's a message, it's also about a man who is also God. And we thank you this morning for giving us not only the privilege to hear of this great truth of the atonement through the God-man Jesus Christ, but you've given us ears to hear it, hearts to believe it and to trust it. We thank you for that as well. We do pray that you would send us from this place, as you've sent us in the past, to walk in your ways, to, to um, manifest Jesus Christ in our lives, both in our living and our dying. And we ask this in his name, for your glory. Amen. So we're going to sing now um, one of the great modern uh, hymns, uh, In Christ Alone My Hope Is Found. Thank you. 
sing together the threefold amen to conclude. And now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.